bring it then under their entire case. But it is good for me to call near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord, that I may declare all thy works. And now it is true that I am near thy kingdom. How be it? There is a kingdom near than I. Yes, amen. so much. Amen. I know everyone got a lesson out of that. Amen. Open your Bible if you would, the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 24. The word of truth we'll get started here. Um, 
about that uh, skating trip there, so we're going to gather up. Saturday, we also have a wedding here, and uh, so those that are coming on the skating trip probably need to be gathering up over here in front of my house. Uh, so not here in front of the church. We won't be able to gather in front of the church because that wedding, so we we'll try to keep those two things separate. And uh, then I want to say thanks to everyone that helped out on that festival. Brother Roy mentioned, you know, we'll just guesstimate. Probably about 550 folks were here, uh, over here at the soccer field. And you folks pitched in and helped once again. Just a huge blessing. Brother Jack and I was talking about it. And, uh, just want to make sure that you guys know you appreciate it. We, we get in over our head on purpose sometimes. And, uh, <laughs> but we know you'll bail us out. <laughs> and especially you teenagers. You guys are a real blessing. So you got started what, way before noon. When it was storming and raining and everything else, we just waiting. They said we had till t <laughs> 10 to make the choice. But we were kicking it back and forth, leaning towards doing it anyway, but then they showed up a couple hours early to make the choice for us. <laughs> and so it worked out real good because by the, uh, you know, the afternoon, the sun came out. And it was just a great day. It's a wonderful day. And uh, appreciate all, everything that went on, so, like I said, especially the teenagers. Yeah. All the effort that you put into it. Amen. That's your ministry. I mean, that's what it was for. Yeah. It's to send you some contacts, and now you can go see these kids and follow up on visitation and trying to get you involved in that. And so, uh, amen, we're going to lead you in that direction. Um, and, uh, Brother Jack's blessing. Amen. Thank amen. you for overseeing that. That was his vision, and uh, oversaw it, and uh, it went off great. Amen. It sure was a real blessing. Now, um, Numbers chapter 24. And I'm going to speak to you about some times where God gives light to those that are in darkness and some situations where some wonderful things are spoken, but the ones who were there seemed unusual and unlikely recipients of those wonderful things that God sent. So there's some instances where God speaks some good things to some bad people. That's what I'm preaching today is God's good promises spoken to the wicked. And we're going to read most of the chapter here, beginning in verse 1. We'll read on down probably to verse 18. But it deals with a mysterious man named Balaam. As a matter of fact, this man appears on the scene in chapter 22, and his influence is seen all the way through chapter 25. And few men in the Bible raise as many problems as Balaam, a man who is apparently from a heathen nation, and yet plainly uh, he had some knowledge of the true God, and uh, proved uh, to be corrupt in the end, but able to prophesy of Israel's future. He listened to the Word of God, faithfully proclaimed the Word of God, yet turned right around and used his influence to lead people into corruption and judgment. So I don't understand this kind of a man, but I know this type does exist. And in the way of Bible prophecy, Balaam turns out to be a type of the one who is prophesied as a forerunner or the PR man of the Antichrist, one we simply refer to as the false prophet, and he's the right-hand man of the beast. Now, uh, if you've ever been reading in your Bible this part of the Scriptures here, dealing with this man, and found yourself somewhat confused with what's going on and what Balaam is actually trying to accomplish, don't be alarmed because you're not alone. Uh, there are many of us who've read this record of the Holy Spirit and found ourselves wondering about Balaam. Uh, he's a strange man, and he's deceptive, and he's saying one thing, and he's turning around and doing something else, and at times he seems to be intent on bringing glory to God, but then he uses his influence to lead people in corruption and rebellion towards God. He's strange, but he's human. A complex, but really just a natural man whom the Bible shows us is motivated by greed. Now beginning here in verse 1, it says, And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but set his face toward the wilderness. Now you can see right there by that statement that on occasion he used enchantments. So he was involved in what we would call occult practices, but at this time he didn't use those things. And God, despite here, he has a message that he wants to get out concerning his blessing on these people. And uh, this man, he's duplicitous and he's er he's erroneous, and, and uh, God wants to use this man to get that message out. Verse 2, Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel abiding in his tents, according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Now, the Spirit of God comes upon him not because of his life. He's not a righteous man. He's not a godly man. But the Spirit of God comes upon him to get this work done. He's about to tell this message about God and his people. 
And so the Spirit of God is wanting to get that done. Verse 3. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. As the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lime aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and the cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. And God brought him forth out of Egypt, as he hath, it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations of, in, of his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched. He lay down as a lion, as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. Notice verse 10. And Balak's answer was kindled, uh, rather, Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. And if you want to understand why Balak's so upset, is because he's hired. He has hired Balaam at this point to come in and bring a curse upon the house of Jacob. And so his whole thing's backfired on what he wants actually to happen. And it says, He smote his hands together, and Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own mind, but what the Lord saith, that will I speak. And now, behold, I go unto my people. Come, therefore, and I will advertise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. So here goes another prophecy from this man named Balaam unto Balak. Verse 15. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Shem. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. Uh, we'll stop right there, and we'll ask God's blessing on the preaching today. Because again, I'm going to preach to you on God's good promises spoken to the wicked. All right, Father, we thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity to preach. And Lord, I pray that you'll enable me, help me to speak, Lord, with clarity and with your uh, spirit and the authority of your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll get the message across and have the church to hear today. May it be fresh, may it help them, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, for these that are here faithfully. Lord, magnify your word, glorify your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for already for the good fellowship that we've had around your word, for the good time that we've enjoyed, Lord, the good singing, and, and Lord, all that's been done. Pray, Lord, that from here on, uh, you'll just continue to bless, give light to the truth, and if there's someone here that's never been saved, we pray for their soul today. Ask the Lord to bring them to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Balak is the, son, is the king of Moab, and apparently he's allied with the uh, Midianites in some way. He'd seen the conquest of Israel, and he thought they are next. They're going to be overcome. So he realizes that physical force is not the answer, and he resorts here uh, to a spiritual warfare of sorts, hiring out a man that has the ability to prophesy and is known for enchantments and such, and he's hired this man Balaam to come and curse the people of Israel. And he's offered Balaam a good price for doing this job. And the prophet's been warned of the Lord and, uh, and refuses to agree. But Balak, he's not one to give up so easy. So what he does is he sends in even more noble princes and even a greater uh, price there of wealth and honor. And he suggests the prophet reconsider the matter. Now we know from the New Testament that deep in Balaam's heart, uh, he wanted to go with those men because he was greedy of gain. The Bible calls this the way of Balaam. It deals with loving riches and, and loving the wages of unrighteousness. Spoken of in 2 Peter, in chapter 2, the Bible says, Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, 
beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Now, that right there is another story. That's another message for another time. But the way of Balaam that is spoken of right there is using religion or piety to gain wealth. And God actually does end up allowing Balaam to go with these men and Balak. And the purpose, again, as I said already, is to get the message of God and His people across to those that are hearing. And in chapter 23, the first vision was given. Balaam makes it clear uh, there in that first vision, he cannot curse Israel because God had blessed Israel. And Balaam sees Israel there as a special people that are called by God and they're separate from other nations. He sees the increase of Israel. He expresses his own, his own desire that he might one day die as a righteous Jew would die in the blessing and the favor of God. And of course, this vision displeases Balak who takes Balaam to another place for a different viewpoint. He said, well, look, look over here, and he's trying to give him a different viewpoint, and that follows a second vision, as the first vision was Israel's calling. The second vision was of Israel's acceptance with God, and it's there in that second vision that uh, Balaam, he gives these words that are pretty memorable. If you look back there at chapter 23 and verse 19, this is Balaam talking. He says, God is not a man that he should lie neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Now, I like what it says there. I like what it doesn't say. It says there that, uh, you know, that he hath beheld no iniquity in Jacob. It doesn't say that there was no iniquity in Jacob. If it would have said there was no iniquity in Jacob, that wouldn't have been true. But it says he hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, showing a deliberate decision on the part of God to favor the house of Jacob. Because certainly the Jews had sinned often. But as far as their standing with God, as far as their acceptance with God, they were sinless. God had beheld no iniquity in them. They had been delivered from Egypt by the blood of the Lamb and by the power of God, and they were God's own purchased possession. Humanly speaking, from that viewpoint, they were failures. Uh, they were a mess, uh, but from God's point of view, they were His people. And that second vision of Balaam, that infuriated Balak again, so he takes him out from Israel there to get another view from another place. And that's where we were in chapter 24, as it mentions there. This time he doesn't use any enchantments. Instead, the Spirit of God came upon him and opened up his eyes, and he sees Israel enjoying her blessings there in the Promised Land with other nations defeated. And uh, this news had King Balak just beside himself because he has hired Balaam to do just the opposite of what he's doing. And uh, he says, The Lord kept you from wealth and honor. And so it leads to another vision, and this vision not only deals with Israel's future, but it also deals with their coming king. The Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Numbers 24, verse 17. Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, speaking of Christ, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Again, that's a promise spoken of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a great promise. A star out of Jacob a scepter rising out of Israel. All this in connection with God's acceptance of His people beholding no iniquity in them and His blessing being determined upon them. That's the connection. This star rising out of Jacob. This scepter rising out of Israel. Now we have record of this spoken prophecy which was uh, spoken by this covetous compromiser. And the record is true and the prophecy is true 
And the recorded prophecy is absolutely wonderful. And here's the amazing thing to me this morning is it's spoken by Balaam to Balak, the king of Moab. So this is a good promise, right? I mean, I think it's a good promise. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's given to someone who's wicked. And I thought about that. It struck me as kind of odd. You know, all the promises of God are wonderful. <laughs> Over in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In that statement Peter makes by the Spirit of God there, God says it's by that avenue by which we have delivered unto us the exceeding great and precious promises that we receive the divine nature and He's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So what we've got to decide is what, what avenue did we receive all those great and exceeding precious promises? Now what is our access to the promises of God? But there's one access. There's one place you're going to be able to look this morning and find the promises of God. It's not going to be at a burning bush for you. It's not going to be an angel visiting you at lunchtime. You're going to receive the promises of God by that King James Bible. You know what it says? It says it's by that avenue right there that He gave you, made you partakers of the divine nature. And it's by that avenue right there that He provided for you all that pertains to life and godliness. And that's, that's a remarkable thing to believe. But what he's saying is, if you've got that King James Bible, you've got all that you need. You've got everything you need that pertains to life and godliness. As this book deals with life. It deals with work. It deals with marriage. It deals with issues of diligence. It deals with matters of personal character. It speaks about raising children and how to educate children. It speaks of having relationships with other people. And it deals with power. It deals with prayer, separation, sanctification. It deals with spirituality. And throughout this book... There's just thousands of promises that inspire hope and provoke faith and it'll lift you and it'll encourage you and it'll motivate you and it'll give you a real charge. That's what the book will do for you. It'll adorn our heads with that blessed hope, that helmet. Get us looking for Jesus Christ. The book will produce a practical righteousness in our life there that will serve as a breastplate. It will gird up the loins of our mind to protect us against deception. It will clothe our feet with the preparation and the purpose of the gospel. And it's a two-edged sword, amen, that is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it can pierce the heart of a man and reveal his inner wickedness and all of his prideful problems that would be otherwise hidden from him. And it brings our own sin to light. And at the same time, it forms for us this shield of faith that we can hide behind and believe and confess the promises of God while this book over and over again magnifies and exalts and glorifies our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's some book you got there. Again, the Bible says, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Thank God for His promises. You go back through there and you see God giving promises to Abraham. He said, I will make of thee a great nation, and all families of the earth shall be blessed in thee. <laughs> Amen. I know my family's been blessed in that promise. I mean, that's where we got the book. It came from Abraham's family. That's where we got our shade. Amen. Listen, in all, in, in the all families of the earth shall be blessed. And he said, I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse those that curse you. That's a wonderful promise. Amen. But you know what? That promise was given to Abraham. And Abraham's father of faith. He's also called a friend of God. Makes sense for God to give him a promise. God gave promises to Joseph. That's what the story is all about. God showed him through a dream how he's going to elevate him, how he's going to promote him above everything else. And he was going to earn the reverence of his own family and through betrayal and servitude and being lied about uh, through prison time, God did finally promote him just like he said. And throughout that promotion there, the whole house of the father of his father Jacob there begins to give him that reverence. And uh, of course, they, they come out on the other side. You see what holds him to the task, what keeps him going was those promises God gave him. But again, that makes sense God gives a man like Joseph promises because he's a man of faith. He's a man of integrity. Uh, he's the greatest type of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Amen. 
And of course, I go on and on. God promised, He gives promises to Moses. He gives promises to Joshua. He gives promises to David. He gives promises to Elijah. But in each of those cases, again, we can go right back and show you the virtue of those godly men. Right. Whether it was meekness or faith or spirituality or courage, they were true men of God. And these divine promises, we say, of course, of course, God gave them great promises. What about this passage this morning? It's a pretty good promise given by revelation of God. He says in Numbers 24, verse 7, He shall pour the water out of his buckets and his seed shall be in many waters. Notice, his king, talking about Jacob's king, his king shall be higher than Agag, that's an understatement, and his kingdom shall be exalted. You drop down there in verse 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Shem. Now those are good promises, dealing with the coming of Christ, His second coming, which is in power and glory, His kingdom. Good promises that are given here, with striking through Balaam to Balak, the king of Moab. And that's a strange thing. But it's not the only time it happens. You can turn there if you want to, but we're not going to read from it. It's in Isaiah chapter 7, if you just want to kind of glance at it. The reason I'm not going to read from it is because I preached from the passage just a few Sunday nights ago. I'm not going to take time to read it all again tonight. But we've been Sunday nights just highlighting the book of Isaiah to some degree. Lord willing, we'll be there again tonight. But it's been said Isaiah is called the little Bible because it has 66 chapters in it, just like the Bible has 66 books. And I know some of you are aware of that fact. Some in here may not be. And throughout the world, you're going to hear people speak against the Bible. You're not going to hear about these kind of things. But uh, uh, the Bible opens with the heavens and the earth. And Isaiah chapter 1 opens with hero heavens, hero earth. And that's a remarkable coincidence there, if you believe in those kind of things. Uh, but if that weren't enough, there you come to the 40th book of the Bible. And up shows John the Baptist. And you come to the 40th chapter of the book of Isaiah. And there's a prophecy of John the Baptist. By the time the record of the Bible closes in the book of Revelation, the 66th book of the Bible, you've got a new heaven and a new earth being promised. And by the time you come to the 66th chapter of Isaiah, there's a new heaven and a new earth being spoken about. So you look at the book of Isaiah, they call it the little Bible, and they do it for good reason. I mean, the, they, the scholars and the textual critics, you know, oh, I just threw up on my mouth a little when I said it get to read and they get to study in there the book of Isaiah and they notice a definite break in the flow of things following the first 39 chapters. And because they're doubters of the Word of God trained to be so, they think it's because it couldn't have been written by the same man. So they say two different men wrote it, which is a crazy thing there because every time the uh, book of Isaiah gets pulled into the New Testament, whether it's in the first 39 chapters or the last 27 chapters, it's attributed to the same source. Amen. The prophet Isaiah. <laughs> So that's just a bunch of hogwash, that stuff they come up with. But here's the thing. The break really is there. The flow of the book does change after 39 chapters. And a Bible reader and a Bible believer understands why that is. Because you've got 39 books in the Bible, which are called the Old Testament. You've got 27 uh, books in the New Testament. Amen. And things change. And what changed, friend, is He came. That star that Balaam prophesied about. That scepter. He came. He changed everything. He came in the world. That's what happened. And in Isaiah chapter 7, again, without turning there, Ahaz is a wicked king. He has resorted to all kinds of wicked things because he's in fear of his life. He's in fear of his kingdom. And he's trying to use politics and diplomacy as a means of maintaining his throne and his power and his protection. And up shows Isaiah to get him a way out of all that mess he's creating for himself. And he starts speaking to him about the Word of God. And he just, he just says to him, he gives him a challenge, simple challenge. He says, ask the Lord a sign. And basically he hands this man a blank check. He said, ask him anything you want. When the heavens above or the deeps beneath, hey, ask him anything. He'll show it to you. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to depend upon all these other foreign kingdoms. You don't need these other foreign powers and foreign uh, kings to stand up for you and stick up for you. You've got the Lord. That's what Isaiah said. Just ask the sign. He'll give it to you. And that pious phony, that religious faker, he says, I'm not going to tempt the Lord by asking a sign. That's, that's religion for you. Yeah. Amen. Uh, he's too good. I mean, he's, he's more spiritual than the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah, he says, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But we weary my God also. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a son. 
Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Amen. Now that king right there is Ahaz, a wicked king. He's offered up his seed to false gods. He's a terrible idolater. He's profaned the house of God. He's rebelled against the commandment of God. He hates the prophet. And he challenges the prophet here saying, I'm not going to tempt the Lord by asking him a sign. You might expect that God with a man like that would just cut off all communication and have nothing else to say to him. But instead, he just directs the prophet to give him this great prophecy. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, again, I think that's a pretty good promise. And then, I'll tell you in uncertain terms, that's, that's a great promise. The whole race is ruined. You understand? I mean, from Adam on down. If you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the salvation of God. God's not this just arbitrarily up there ruling who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. Amen. Some people define the sovereignty of God in just that fashion, and that's blasphemy. Amen. The fact is, the whole race is going to hell. Right. And God sent a Savior. Amen. He intervened. We ruined by sin through our bloodline. We're born with it in us. It causes us to manifest itself in our behavior. And you see that throughout all the world. And people say, well, if there was a God... Why is all this stuff happening in the world? Well, God in His Word tells you what the problem is. Right, it's men and their sin. That's Amen. the problem. Amen. And the story of the Gospel is the solution. Amen. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. Amen. And that's the answer. And so, if He would have came and He would not have been virgin born, friend, that means He would have the same blood in Him that you've got in you. And He wouldn't be the Savior. Amen. He'd just be a sinful man like you. He couldn't save you. He couldn't Amen. save Himself. And that'd be the truth. Now, the way that we could be reconciled to God was through a perfect sacrifice offered up by a perfect priest. And this perfect priest, according to Scripture, had to be holy. He had to be harmless. He had to be undefiled with sin. He had to be someone who would not die higher than the heavens. That's the kind of priest we have to have. And he says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, we have such a high priest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the kind of priest we've got. Those of us that have the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So I think we can all agree. That prophecy of the virgin birth, yeah, that's pretty important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty good one right there. Yeah. Over there in, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 4, it talks about how He'd come and made of a woman. And that's that prophecy, again, being fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that prophecy was given to Ahaz, a wicked king. That was Isaiah, a good man, giving that prophecy to a wicked king. Now look over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Again, the Bible says, For by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And that's a reference to Adam, infecting the whole race with his sin. And so as God begins to straighten all that's happened with this fall, in Genesis chapter 3, He deals with them one at a time. There's Adam, there's Eve, and there's the serpent. He starts with the serpent there in Genesis 3.14. He pulls them all off by themselves. And he says in verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Notice. And between thy seed, Satan has a seed, between thy seed and, notice, her seed. Yeah. That's a miracle. You say, why? Because a woman don't have seed. Right. Her seed, it, it, that seed, it shall bruise thy head, Satan. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now right there in verse 15, that right there is the first promise of the Redeemer in the Bible. Right. Yeah. It's a promise I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It's a reference to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, again, fulfilled in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, where he says, When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth the Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. That's the fulfillment. This reference in Genesis 3.15 is a promise of the coming of the Redeemer who would successfully put Satan under his heel. And who is this good promise spoken to? Verse 14 the Lord God said unto the serpent. That's an amazing thing. Amen. Amen. Ironically, the first promise of the Redeemer is given to the devil. Amen. This is the promise of the star out of Jacob, the scepter rising out of Israel that was spoken by Balaam to Balak, the king of Moab, 
This is the good promise of the coming Redeemer that was spoken to Satan. This is the God's good promise that was uh, interpreted God with us. Emmanuel that was spoken to Ahaz, the wicked king of Judah. And the same happens throughout the Bible. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel the prophet is a great man. But Dan all the information of Daniel chapter 2, which is the times of the Gentiles, yeah. that was given to a wicked king. Amen. Daniel was able to interpret the dream but the dream was had by a wicked king named Nebuchadnezzar. Right. God gave all that promise through that man right there. I mean, of course, we read through the Old Testament Scriptures and we see where Isaiah, Hosea, Jeremiah, Amos, and all that, God speaking of Israel's future glory in that context and of the kingdom. And it confirms what you read in Daniel chapter 2. Right. But that information in Daniel chapter 2, that is a wicked king. Now, this is this is a phenomenon, right? That's strange. But we read in the Bible there in Isaiah chapter 1 again, the Lord giving promise to Israel. And He says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Listen, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's a good promise right there. Lord said, I'll wash all your sins away. I'll clean you up. I'll make you white. Listen, that right there isn't given to somebody because of their righteousness. That's not given to somebody because of their faithfulness. That's not given to somebody because of their integrity and their virtue. That is God giving a good promise to some wicked people that have departed from Him. They're wayward. They're defiled. They're unclean. And the Lord said, I'll clean you up. Come back. Come now. Let's reason together. I'll clean you up. That's a good promise. Now, that being said, you see where this is going this morning, right? <laughs> Romans chapter 4, if you want to look over there real quick. Again, God has given good promises to wicked people, and that's we thought, that's wild. But God's given some good promises to you and me. Right. <laughs> and uh, let's face it, the Word of God condemns us all in our natural state. Now, to justify men, man will naturally become a humanist. And that means he'll argue that men aren't what the Bible says they are. He has to if he's a humanist. I mean, he's all about men and the goodness of man. So he can't believe what the Bible says, so he has to condemn the Bible. And his words will be careful and chosen. He's got to discredit the Bible because of what it says about men. So here he is. You talk about the Lord taking the wise in his own craftiness so that he can prove men aren't that bad and you can't trust what the Bible says about men. He has to discredit the Bible. And what does he say? Well, it's just written by men. <laughs> What's the problem? If men are so wonderful and they wrote the Bible, what's the problem with the Bible? You see, his idea is you won't trust the Bible because he knows naturally you don't trust men. And you shouldn't. Because men can't be trusted. And so he, he's trying to make that point to feel good about himself and by his very attempt to discredit the Bible, God's holy word, he proves exactly he is what the word of God says he is. He's a condemned sinner. He got to try to malign God and His Word to make His point there. And the reason is the only righteousness that's going to pass God's judgment is His own righteousness. Amen. And that's why we can't pass God's judgment there. And so what has to happen in order for a man to be justified with God? It's not just a matter of being justified in each other's side. It's a matter of being justified in the sight of God as ju God judges by Himself. How can a man be just with God? How can a person have God's righteousness? Well, here in Romans chapter 4, well, the end of chapter 3, he's already said there to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. <laughs> that's it right there. That's the standard that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. That's the issue. Do you have His righteousness? You say, no, sir, I don't. And I'll agree with you. You don't, not in your natural state. The only way you'll get it is for God to give it to you. Amen. God to put it to your record. And here in Romans chapter 4, here's what he says. What shall we then say that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh that found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Friends, that's all that matters. Amen. Forget what religion teaches. Amen. Doesn't matter what every other Baptist church says. Amen. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, 
but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. Now, friend, that is a good promise right there. Amen. And it's given to the ungodly. And that's it. You need God's righteousness and you don't Amen. have it. Amen. If you just step up and say, hey, that's me right there. I'm ungodly. Yeah. And just believe. That's what he says. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Friends, that's an amazing promise. That's an amazing promise. And you know what the truth is? It's given to bad people. That's me, you, and all our kinfolk. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Your first birth was the natural birth. You were born with Adam's sin in you. It's transferred through the bloodline, and that's why you didn't have to be taught how to do anything wrong. You knew how to do wrong without anyone teaching you. Amen. You knew it naturally. you got to be kidding me. Somebody said, well, I, I always think the right thoughts. <laughs> I always say the right words. I always do the right things. You must have the standards of an alley cat. Yeah. What is your definition of right? The fact is, every man in his best state is altogether vanity. Amen. And you can't pass God's righteousness and His standard of righteousness without having God's righteousness. Because you're not righteous in God's eyes unless you're righteous as God. You say, well then who then can be saved? <laughs> to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. The Lord said, you need my righteousness? You don't have it. But you know what? I'll give it to you. Amen. If you'll believe on my son, Jesus Christ, you'll believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. Amen. you first got to realize you're ungodly. You can't be saved until you realize you're in trouble. You have to realize you're a sinner before you can be saved. This morning, do you realize you're a sinner? Do you know you're a sinner? If you realize this morning you're a sinner condemned in the sight of God, there's good news for you. Christ Jesus really did come into the world. To save sinners. He came for you. God sent not a son into the world, condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That being said, let's stand for prayer, all right? And we'll go ahead and get ready to close this morning. Some folks say they don't have God's righteousness and they go about trying to earn it. And you can't.